Uh, welcome everybody to our first QMUL Law Alumni Series seminar for 2022. I'm Mario Mendez, a reader in law at QM and also a QMUL Law Alumni myself. This series was conceived as a way for us to nurture our links with our alumni and keep us engaged with each other. And we are delighted that alumni from all over the world are able to partake in this endeavor. Before I turn to our event and speaker for today, I just want to plug some of our alumni seminars to come. Next month, one of our most distinguished alumni and former faculty member at QM Law, Professor Chinkin, will be talking on the subject of women peace, security, and international law. In March, alumna Dr. Ramsunda will be speaking on state responsibility for the support of armed groups in the Commission of International Crimes. And in April, Dr. Merkins, both a QMUL law grad and former member of the Department of Law, will be presenting on the UK as a regional state. The URL that I hope you can see on the PowerPoint at towards the bottom of the PowerPoint has links for videos to the prior seminars and signing up details for forthcoming seminars in this series will also go on this URL. Turning now to our seminar and speaker for today, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Fabio Giuffrida, who will be speaking about the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Fabio completed his pre-doctoral studies in Italy before coming to QMUL on a scholarship to pursue his doctoral studies. He completed his PhD in 2019 under the supervision of Professor Mitsiligas, who I believe is, is here with us today. And Fabio was then uh, a postdoc at the University of Luxembourg before joining the European Commission in 2020. Before passing the virtual floor to um, Fabio, just a quick word on the format for today. Fabio will be speaking for somewhere between 30 and 35 minutes, and this aspect of the seminar will be recorded. And we then go to the unrecorded question and answer session. During that question and answer session, the audience are free to ask questions directly. So please do pop up on screen um, to ask your question, or if you prefer, just turn your mic on um, without the video to ask a question. And you're also free to use the chat function if you prefer, and I will read the questions out. Can I remind the audience as well to please keep mics off during Fabio's presentation? And thank you very much. Fabio, please do start when you are ready. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Mario, for the uh, introduction. And uh, first of all, let me say also thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me uh, to be uh, here virtually uh, again at uh, QMUL. Um, and I'm uh, delighted indeed to have the uh, opportunity uh, to give this uh, the presentation, is, which is meant to be uh, really mostly a discussion with you. Uh, so I will try now to share my screen. Mario, I think I can do it. Yeah, so okay. So just one sec. So I hope you can uh, uh, see my my screen now. Is it is it all fine? Yes, yes, yes it's fine. Okay, okay, so thank you very much again. Um, so uh, the um, subject of my uh, presentation today is uh, the uh, European Public uh, Prosecutor's Office, uh, to which I will refer in my presentation as uh, EPPO or uh, EPPO, uh, which was uh, the uh, subject of my uh, PhD uh, thesis first, uh, and then actually happened to be now part of my um, daily job at the uh, European Commission, so I'm lucky enough to be able to work on what has been subject the subject of my um, PhD thesis. And um, today, however, I will be speaking in my personal uh, capacity, so it will be my own uh, opinions I will be um, discussing. 
And uh, the aim of my presentation is um, uh, perhaps to share with you a bit uh, the reasons why I think the EPPO is a fascinating uh, topic. And it's a fascinating topic because it opens up a new whole series of uh, questions and challenges for uh, the European Union. And I would like to uh, point out a few of these uh, challenges and how really the EPPO is a change in itself and how the EPPO can in turn change the uh, European Union. So uh, in order to do so, uh, what I will do is that uh, first I will very shortly present uh, how the EPPO works. Uh, then I will discuss uh, three key elements uh, for the uh, functioning of the EPPO and three key aspects that show how new and original the EPPO is. So the relations of the EPPO with uh, the member states of the European Union, the relations of the EPPO with the member states of the European Union that do not uh, participate in the EPPO, because uh, that's uh, maybe a bit of a spoiler, uh, but I can already anticipate that the EPPO has not been established by all 27 member states of the European Union, uh, but it has been established by means of, of what is called enhanced cooperation. So for the moment, 22 out of 27 member states of the European Union participate in the EPPO. EPPO. And then I will discuss briefly the relations of the EPPO with uh, third uh, countries, and then I will draw uh, some uh, conclusions. So uh, starting very, um, very, very briefly on uh, the EPPO in general, uh, just to give you an idea of what the EPPO is and us in one sentence, uh, the EPPO is the independent European Union body that is competent to investigate and prosecute crimes affecting the budget of the European Union. So uh, for example, fraud affecting the budget of the European Union is the crime, is one of the crimes on which the EPPO uh, carries out its investigation and uh, prosecutions. So uh, the, um, what is interesting to note at this stage, just as a way of introduction to the EPPO, is that uh, first of all, the EPPO for the moment has only a limited uh, competence. So the EPPO is not competent for, I don't know, money laundering in general or for organized crime in general, but only for crimes affecting the budget of the European Union for the moment. Because as we will see in a couple of uh, minutes, its competence might be extended in the future. And the other element, which uh, I think it's important to bear in mind already now, is that the EPPO is a prosecutor. Uh, so like any prosecuting authority, the EPPO prosecutes and investigates crimes. But unlike national prosecutors who are supported by national uh, police authorities and then brings the case before national courts, the European public prosecutors is not supported by a European uh, police. The European public prosecutors, uh, the European public prosecutors office does not uh, prosecute before a European uh, criminal court, but the EPPO is uh, strongly reliant on a national system, uh, national systems, because the EPPO is supported by national police and the EPPO prosecutes individuals before national courts. So as you can already see from this very short introduction, the EPPO really builds upon a strong link, a strong mix between European elements, European components, and national ones. The um, other element that I wanted to uh, discuss uh, is uh, what I already anticipated in my previous slide, uh, namely the fact that the, EPP, the EPPO has been established by means of enhanced cooperation. So uh, the regulation uh, that established the EPPO was adopted in uh, 2017. And uh, for the moment, 22 member states of the European Union participate in the EPPO, but five member states have decided not to participate in the EPPO. So for the moment, Denmark, Ireland, Sweden, Poland, and Hungary have decided not to uh, join uh, the uh, EPPO. And then uh, the, um, uh, also another element which in a way shows how uh, new uh, the EPPO is, is the fact that actually the EPPO, although it's been formally established in 2017, started its operation only last year in June, on the 1st of June, 2021. So uh, we are about six months after the start of the investigations of the EPPO. So it's quite uh, a, new, um, a new body. 
And here there is one more element, which I think is important to better understand the EPPO. And that's the fact that the EPPO, um, the headquarters of the EPPO are in uh, Luxembourg, uh, where also the Court of Justice uh, sits. But that's not all of it, in the sense that uh, the EPPO has a complex structure, which is different uh, from the structure of other EU bodies, because the EPPO has a central structure in Luxembourg, and then it has also what is called a decentralized level, meaning that there are people working for the EPPO in each of the 22 member states participating in the EPPO, which is something uh, quite new in European Union law, if you think about it, because, for example, I don't know, the Court of Justice, indeed, all the people working for the Court of Justice are in Luxembourg. Uh, there are no people working for the Court of Justice in the member states. But the EPPO has this uh, unique and one-of-a-kind structure in which there is a central level in Luxembourg and then a decentralized level in each of the 22 uh, member states. And I tried to uh, summarize uh, the uh, structure of the EPPO uh, with uh, this slide, uh, which uh, perhaps show how uh, complex the structure of the EPPO um, is. And I will not go into the details, but it just, it's just for you to give an idea of how the EPPO is structured, because this will help us better understand what are the challenges for uh, the EPPO. So if you look uh, into, the, um, into the slide, then you will see that we will have a, we have a central office, which is the first, let's say, two lines of the slides. So the central office in Luxembourg is composed, first of all, by the college. And the college, in turn, is composed by the European chief uh, prosecutor, uh, who is currently a Romanian prosecutor, and one European prosecutor per member state. So each of the 22 member states participating in the EPPO has one European prosecutor that is sent uh, to uh, Luxembourg. But the College of the EPPO does not have operational power. So the College of the EPPO does not investigate, does not prosecute. There is, however, there is, however, another uh, smaller body, a uh, smaller body still in Luxembourg that is competent to direct, to steer the investigations of the EPPO, and this is called the uh, permanent chamber, which is the middle part of the slides. Uh, so uh, I just put three permanent chambers for the sake of um, of clarity, but actually there are fifteen uh, permanent chambers in uh, Luxembourg, and the permanent chambers are composed by sorry, are composed by three uh, people. So the European chief prosecutor and two of the 22 European prosecutors. So for example, we have a permanent chamber composed by the European chief prosecutor and then the European prosecutor from, let's say, Malta and Germany. Another one with uh, the European chief prosecutor and then the European prosecutor from Spain and Estonia and so on and so forth. And the permanent chambers are, uh, so to say, the beating heart of the EPPO, because the permanent chambers are those that take uh, the decision, for example, to start uh, the investigations or to indict uh, uh, um, a person, to prosecute a person. So let's take the example of a crime affecting the budget of the European Union that is committed, let's say, in Belgium, the country where I currently uh, live. So in this case, the um, uh, development of the investigations and the decision to start the investigation and the decision eventually to prosecute uh, the person is taken by the permanent chamber in uh, Luxembourg. However, as you can understand, is uh, to say the least, not that practical for a body sitting in Luxembourg to be able to steer the investigations of a crime that is commit committed in uh, Belgium. And at the end of the day, Belgium is actually quite close to Luxembourg, but we can think of, for example, a crime committed in uh, Malta or Cyprus. So it would not be very practical for uh, the uh, permanent chamber in Luxembourg to steer the investigations ongoing in Cyprus. And that's the reason why the EPPO also has uh, what we call the decentralized level, which is the bottom part of the slide, which means that in each of the 22 member states participating in uh, EPPO, there are at least 
two national prosecutors who stopped working for the national system and started working for the EPPO as members of the EPPO, and they are called European Delegated Prosecutors. So that's the reason why you see EDPs at the bottom of the slide. So it means that in Belgium, there are two European Delegated Prosecutors who used to be national prosecutors and now actually work only for the EPPO on EPPO uh, cases. And the number of uh, European delegated prosecutors actually is different from member state to member states because, for example, in Italy, there are more uh, than uh, 20. But what I think is important to bear in mind is that this complex structure of the EPPO was a compromise between a European Union body, which is able to take decision at the European Union level, which is the uh, permanent chamber, but it's also a compromise between the European, let's say indeed input, but also the necessary national expertise. Because for example, again, going back to the example of the crime committed in Belgium, if this crime committed in Belgium is a crime affecting the budget of the European Union, this crime will be investigated by the European delegated prosecutors from Belgium in Belgium under the control of the uh, central level in um, uh, Luxembourg. So uh, the structure of the EPPO is on two levels, central level in Luxembourg and decentralized level in each of the 22 member states participating in the EPP. So if this is clear and there are no, let's say, uh, pressing questions, then uh, I would move on. And maybe, of course, if there is any question, happy to take it either now or uh, later. But now, if we start looking into some of the questions and the challenges that are connected with the functioning of the uh, EPPO, the first element that actually comes to the fore is the fact that the EPPO strongly relies on national law and uh, national authorities. So uh, going back to our example, whenever there is a crime affecting the budget of the European Union that is committed in Belgium and is investigated by uh, the um, national, uh, it is investigated by the EPPO, of course, then the EPPO will have to rely on the uh, national police. So the European delegated prosecutors working from the EPPO will have to rely on uh, national police. And then at the end, the case will be, uh, will be uh, judged by Belgian courts. So there is a strong link between national law and authorities and European law in the whole functioning of the uh, EPP. And this link between the, uh, let's say, European Union level and the national level is even stronger if, uh, first of all, we look at the material, at the material competence of the EPPO. Because uh, as I said at the beginning, the EPPO is competent for crimes affecting the budget of the European Union. However, these crimes are provided for, are defined in a, a directive of the European Union, which is the directive that uh, lays down the elements and the sanctions for uh, the crimes falling within the competence of the uh, EPPO. And uh, the EPPO is also competent for organized crime as long as organized crime affects the budget of the European Union. And again, the definition of organized crime is included in a framework decision that was adopted by the European Union in 2008. And what is the element of interest here? Is uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that the directive and the framework decision needs to be implemented by the member states. So it means that each of the 22 member states has implemented the directive that actually draws the boundaries of the competence of the EPPO. So we have a very, uh, I would say, a unique situation in EU law in which we have a European Union body, the EPPO, which is established by a regulation which is directly applicable, but the competence of this body. So the crimes for which the, this body is competent are actually defined into national law. Which also means that, in theory, there might be a case in which the same fact is a crime in one member state and is not a crime in another member state. So we will have a situation which is a bit weird, in which the same um, European Union body will have a different competence according to the member state in which the crime has been committed, precisely because the competence of the EPPO is not defined in the regulation, 
which would be uh, directly applicable, but is defined in a directive which needs to be implemented by the uh, member states. So that's the first element of uh, complexity, or even if we want the first question of the APPO. So how we can ensure that the APPO can be as consistent as possible, considering the strong reliance on uh, national. The second uh, question or the second element of uh, novelty of the APPO, so to say, concerns the judicial review of the acts of the APPO. Because as is the case with any uh, public prosecutors, of course, a key, any public prosecutors of uh, prosecutor, of course, a key question is who is competent to review the acts of the APPO? So which is the court that is competent, for example, to decide whether the decision of the APPO to order the white tapping or to order search and seizure or to order the questioning of a given witness is legal? So which is the authority that is competent to decide on whether the acts of the APPO are legal or not? And now one, of course, would expect that the competence lies with uh, the Court of Justice, because the European Union, uh, the EPO is a body of the European Union, is an office of the European Union, and one of the key constitutional basic principle of the European Union is that acts and decisions of European Union bodies shall be reviewed by the Court of Justice of the European Union, because national courts do not have the power to declare null and void acts and decisions of European Union bodies. However, and that's indeed the second element of um, novelty of the EPPO, so to say, precisely because the EPPO strongly relies on national law, precisely because the EPPO also works in accordance with national law, the regulation provides that the judicial review of the acts of the EPPO lies with national courts. So the decision of the EPPO uh, to, for example, indeed uh, prosecute a person or the decision of the EPPO uh, of the member states were to conduct the investigation and the prosecutions, all these decisions are to be reviewed by national courts. And, there, and here again, we have uh, another, if we want, existential question of uh, the EPPO. So how can uh, a European Union body be subject to the jurisdiction of national Courts. And that's another element of uh, which makes the EPO um, complex, uh, exceptional, but also fac fascinating uh, at the same time. And then the third uh, element, which I think is uh, very interesting in the functioning of the APPO, concerns um, conflicts of jurisdiction. So, uh, as you know, uh, irrespective of the EPPO in general, uh, there, is, um, there are cases in which a crime, especially, uh, especially a cross-border crime, so a crime that actually involves more than one member state. Uh, so there are cases in which cross-border crimes are involved more than one member state, so actually more than one member state would have jurisdiction on that case. So the uh, authorities of different member states would be competent to investigate and prosecute the same facts. So as things stand for the moment in European Union law, there are no binding rules on, on conflicts of jurisdiction, meaning that whenever there is a cross-border crime committed in uh, Europe and more than one member state would be competent to investigate and prosecute that case, there are no binding rules to decide which of them should investigate and prosecute. EU law only provides for a mechanism of consultation among national authorities, but there are no binding rules deciding or setting out uh, the criteria according to which the competent member state is identified. And here the EPO represents uh, a step forward in EU law, uh, so that's why I also uh, call it uh, one, uh, my, my presentation one step forward in European integration, because the EPO regulation is uh, the first piece of legislation of, European, of the European Union in which there are binding rules on conflicts of jurisdiction. So this means that whenever there is a case falling within the competence of the EPPO and the activities of the EPPO could in principle take place in more than one member state because one more than one member state would have jurisdiction, then the EPPO regulation provides for some binding criteria in accordance with which the competence or better, in accordance with which uh, the member states where the activities of the EPPO have to be carried out is identified. So the regulation provides that the activities of the APPO, even when there is more than one member state that is competent, should take place in the country where actually the crime was committed, or if, if uh, uh, for any reason it needs to be carried out in another member state, that's the member state of the nationality of the suspect, and so on and so forth. 
So uh, the APPO is, uh, uh, brings actually European Union law one step for, further also in uh, that respect. And then um, one more uh, um, element uh, of, uh, if we want, complexity of the APPO is uh, the um, what we could call the spillover effect of uh, the uh, EPPO. Uh, what I mean with that, I mean that uh, the EPPO works as we have seen uh, in the member states, so also operates in the member states and works closely with uh, member states authorities. So this means that the regulation that established the APPO had to be somehow um, implemented in the member states, although implementing is not the right verb because uh, regulation are directly applicable, so they don't need implementation in the member states. But uh, in any case, the member states that participate in the APPO had to change their national, uh, their national laws in order to ensure that the EPPO could exercise its power. So uh, the member states had to change, for example, their code of criminal procedure in order to um, allow the European delegated prosecutors to exercise the same powers of national prosecutors. So all the 22 member states have changed uh, their national law in order to allow the uh, ECO to carry out its activity. And in some cases, what we have um, seen is that actually some member states used the occasion of the APPO uh, as a trigger to uh, finally change their own national system. And here, uh, the example that they choose uh, is that they chose is the one of um, Spain. So uh, Spain is one of the member states of the European Union in which uh, the um, pre-trial phase of criminal proceedings is uh, strongly reliant on the uh, so-called investigative uh, judge. So what is called in the uh, French speaking countries, the uh, juge d'instruction. Um, so the, uh, in, in Spain, like for example, in France and in Belgium, whenever there are investigations ongoing on a given crime, and the prosecutor needs to take an intrusive measure, such as, for example, white tapping, or, um, for example, uh, putting a person in um, uh, pretrial detention, and so on and so forth. All these powers do not lie with uh, the prosecutor, but with the investigative judge. And actually, the investigative judge is not uh, is actually competent to take the lead of the investigation. So the prosecutors uh, actually loses control of the investigation, and then the investigative judge starts the investigation upon request of the prosecutor. Now, as you can understand, this, of course, is a system that does not work for the APPO, because the APPO needs, in accordance with the regulation, needs to be in the lead of the investigations concerning crimes affecting the budget of the European Union. And therefore, in the member states in which there is an investigative judge, the member states have changed their law in order to make an exception for EPPO cases in which the investigative judge does not have the usual broad powers. And in the case of Spain, actually, not only Spain has introduced this um, exception for EPPO cases in which the investigative judge does not have the usual uh, powers, but in Spain, the issue more in general of the investigative judge has been discussed for decades, and there have been discussion, uh, discussions for decades to abolish the uh, investigative judge, but never this reform took place until the moment in which Spain had to change its system in order to apply the EPO regulation. And so actually Spain took the opportunity of the EPO regulation to finally change its own legal system and finally adopt a new system of criminal justice in which there is no more and there is no role anymore for the investigative judge. So, I don't know if uh, some of you can read uh, Spanish, but I just took one sentence from the um, Travaux Préparatoires of the uh, new reform of the criminal proceedings in uh, Spain. And uh, the, the Travaux Préparatoires say that actually the regulation of the APPO was the final input for a structural reform of the uh, Spanish criminal procedure. So the APPO became actually a trigger, as had a spillover effect because it actually produced changes even beyond its own uh, reality. 
So these are some elements that shows the complexity, the challenges, and the question that goes with the APPO. But I would like to uh, mention two more. The first one concerns the competence of the APPO, because as I said, uh, the, uh, the APPO for the moment has a very narrow competence, so crimes affecting the budget of the European Union. But in the future, its competence can be extended to other cross-border crimes. However, since this would be extremely sensitive on, on the political level, I mean, it was already sensitive to establish the APPO because the member states, for the first time, had to surrender their sovereignty in the field of criminal law to this extent to a body of the European Union. So if the EPPO is given even more powers, of course, this is extremely sensitive on the political level. And that's the reason why this decision on the extension of the competence of the EPPO has to be taken by the European Council, so which is the highest political body in the European Union by unanimity. So even including the member states that currently do not participate in the EPPO. So for the moment, it is unlikely that this will happen, but actually reflections have started on this extension of competence of the EPPO. So for example, the uh, commission back in 2018 suggested the extension of the competence of the EPPO to uh, cross-border terrorism, and uh, the European Parliament called for the extension of the competence of the EPPO to cross-border environmental crime. So it might be the case that in the future the EPPO will, will be given even more powers than it currently has. And the third element uh, that is very uh, interesting to um, discuss with regard to the relations of the EPPO and uh, the um, member states that participate in uh, the EPPO is uh, this, uh, the regulation on um, general regime of conditionality for the protection of the union budget, of the union budget, uh, which uh, is also known as the rule of law, of law, the rule of law regulation, which has been adopted in uh, December 2020. And this regulation provides it's in essence that when there are deficiencies with regard to the rule of law in the member states, and these deficiencies actually affect or may affect the budget of the European Union, then the Council, upon proposal of the Commission, can take some uh, sanction measures towards the member states, such as suspension of the uh, payments. And what is interesting is that this regulation provides uh, a number of, uh, so to say, um, alarm bells, so cases in which uh, that can show that actually there are problems concerning the rule of law in the member states. And one of these elements is the cooperation with uh, the EPPO. So the effective and timely cooperation with the EPPO in its investigations and prosecutions is one of the elements that could trigger sanction against the member states under the rule of law regulation. And for the moment, the, this regulation has not been applied, but I would think, for example, of cases in which uh, national police authorities, for example, systematically refuse to cooperate with uh, the EPPO. This would be a case in which there is no effective cooperation between the EPPO and the um, national authorities, and therefore this could justify some measures against the uh, member states. Moving on the, uh, to uh, the relations between the EPPO and the non-participating member states, but I will try to, let's say, wrap up in about five minutes so that maybe we can have some time for uh, Q&A. There are two uh, things I would like to discuss with regard to the EPPO and the non-participating member states. The first one is, let's say, a political, uh, legal, but also symbolic uh, problem, which made which made uh, the EPPO very contentious uh, contentious from the very beginning, and it was hotly uh, debated during the negotiations. And the, and the, that's the following problem. The problem is that the EPPO has been established with the aim to protect the budget of the European Union. The budget of the European Union is a legal interest that pertains to the European Union as such, to the European Union as a, a sui generis international organization. It's, if we want, uh, even a federal interest, because it's an interest of the European Union itself, all member states benefit from the European budget. So to what extent can we accept that actually five member states that, be that actually benefit from the budget of the European Union, and some of them even quite substantially, have decided not to join the uh, EPPO. So to what extent can we on the political level accept that the body that is meant to protect the budget of the European Union is not um, 
uh, established by all the member states of the uh, European Union. And this uh, question becomes even more uh, pressing in the current uh, context in which uh, the European Union is actually distributing a lot of funds across the European Union in the context of the so-called next generation uh, EU. And that's the reason why at some point during the negotiations, uh, this idea of um, uh, making the uh, EU funds conditional upon participation of the EPPO was uh, circulated. So at some point, uh, it was um, uh, it was discussed whether it was not appropriate uh, to introduce something like no EPPO, no money, as I put in the slide, meaning that participation in the EPPO would be a precondition to enjoy uh, EU funds. But at the end of the day, this condition has not been uh, included. And actually, the Commissioner for Justice back in 2017 clearly said, we don't mean to make EU funds conditional upon participation in, on, in the EPPO. But of course, it is clear that participation in the EPPO is a crucial element to strengthen the protection of the budget of the European Union. And the other element I want to uh, discuss uh, in the, uh, with regard to the, to the relations between the EPPO and the non-participating member states is the fact that the EPPO still needs to cooperate with the non-participating member states, because we might clearly have a case of a crime, for example, committed in, let's say, Poland and Hungary, uh, and also involving Spain and um, Italy. So in this cross-border case, it might be the case that the EPPO will need the support of the non-participating member states. So how is this done? And here I actually copy pasted the text of Article 105, Paragraph 3 of the EPO regulation, which in essence says two things. It says that, uh, first of all, there could be a legal interest, uh, sorry, a legal instrument on the cooperation between the EPPO and the non-participating member state. So an ad hoc instrument on the cooperation between the EPPO and the non-participating member states. But this instrument has not been adopted. So in the absence of this legal instrument, the uh, regulation provides that the member states participating in the EPPO shall notify the EPPO as a competent authority for the purpose of the existing Union Acts on Judicial Cooperation. So in practical terms, um, this means that uh, bearing in mind that the European Union law is actually now provided with, has actually a lot of instruments concerning judicial cooperation. So, for example, the European Arrest Warrant, which is the instrument to ensure extradition or better surrender uh, between the member states, or the European Investigation Order, which is the instrument that allows the gathering of criminal evidence across the member states. These instruments also apply or shall apply to the EPPO, and the EPPO should be considered as a competent authority for the purposes of, for the purposes of this instrument. And this is only possible if the member states notify the EPPO as a competent authority. So in other words, the member states participating in the EPPO are currently notifying to the Commission or to the Council the EPPO as a competent authority for the purpose of the, for example, European investigation order, for the purpose of the European arrest warrant, or for the purpose of the EU instrument on uh, joint investigation. And this notification allows the EPPO to rely on these instruments to obtain the cooperation of the non-participating member states. So thanks to this notification, for example, if the EPPO needs the surrender of a person from, let's say, Hungary, uh, Poland, or Sweden, then the EPPO can send an European arrest warrant to the Polish or Hungarian authorities and ask for the surrender of the uh, individual. And of course, uh, this is, um, I think, another uh, element of um, complexity, but also <clears throat> A fascinating element of the EPPO because what we are uh, witnessing here is uh, the case of the um, EPP of the EPPO that was actually created after all the instruments of judicial cooperation uh, at the European Union level. But now this instrument that have been thought for national authorities have to apply to the EPPO, which is an European Union um, body. I think there is something in the chat. I'm not sure what it is. Um, we can we can come back to that. I'll I'll 
sorry, okay. um, Fabio, the question there from Andres, we can come back to that when you're finished with your talk, because it okay. goes back to your earlier query, uh, your earlier uh, coverage. Okay, okay, super. So I will uh, then uh, just um, move on. Let me... Okay, perfect. So, um, the, um, so indeed, what I was saying indeed there is the fact that now we have this European Union body that uh, is um, so is trying uh, to work and to cooperate with uh, other national authorities on the basis of uh, instruments that actually were not thought for the APPO, but were thought for national uh, authorities. So we kind of um, witness to a process in which we are trying to adapt the existing union law to a new body in uh, European um, in, in the context of the European Union. And of course, the question there is also to what extent the member states that do not participate in the APPO are obliged uh, to cooperate with the APPO on the basis of these uh, instruments. And one of the answers that, um, that we often uh, read and listen to is the fact that member states are still, uh, that member states that do not participate in the APPO are still obliged to cooperate in light of the general principle of uh, sincere cooperation, which is one of the founding and constitutional principles of the European Union, which also means that member states that do not participate in uh, an enhanced cooperation should not hinder uh, the achievement of the objectives of the uh, enhanced uh, cooperation. Um, I will uh, skip the uh, relations of the APPO with uh, third countries, perhaps maybe just saying that uh, this uh, same uh, issue of the uh, notification of the APPO as a competent authority for the purpose of existing instrument has also been taking place vis-a-vis uh, -vis third countries. So the member states or the European Union are actually notifying the EPO as a competent authority for the purposes of cooperation with third countries. So the EPO should be in a position to cooperate with third countries in the same way as national prosecutors do. And one of the third countries that is actually involved by, the, by this process is the United Kingdom, because the European Union notified the EPPO as a competent authority for the purpose of judicial cooperation with the the um, United Kingdom. So uh, there is a notification that was added to the, tree, uh, to the uh, trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK, but we, we might come back to this if uh, we have time um, in the Q&A. So just to conclude, uh, the, uh, what, I, what I hope was uh, clear in my presentation is that the EPPO is uh, uh, the revolutionary uh, step forward in EU law, because that's the first EU body which has direct powers vis-a-vis -vis the individuals in the field of uh, criminal law. It's an EU body, but at the same time, it has strong uh, national components. It is a new model of judicial cooperation because so far, actually, we only had bodies that were meant to support national authorities. Here we have a body that actually replaces national authorities in their investigation and prosecution. So actually, what I put in this slide is that the EPO is a new model of judicial cooperation, or even better, it's the first model of judicial integration in criminal matters within uh, the EU. The EPPO, as we have seen with the example, is has also been the trigger for new rules in criminal justice in the member states, but also the EPPO as such is, uh, has some uh, features that are quite different uh, for, uh, compared to the usual functioning of the uh, prosecutors. And just to name one, the EPPO is entirely independent from the member states and from EU institutions, whereas in some member states, the prosecutors are actually part of the executive. So they still receive or could receive, at least in principle, instructions from their ministers of justice, whereas the EPPO is uh, supposed to be entirely uh, independent. And of course, as we have seen also with regard to the relations between the EPPO and the non-participating member states, the EPPO also raises new question of what we could well, what we could call Europeanization a la carte. So the fact that some member states have decided not to join uh, the EPPO is uh, or might be at least uh, controversial. The, at the same time, the EPPO is what is called, what has been called a new kid of the block on the block. So actually poses new challenges for EU in the EU architecture. And we just saw, for example, the relations of the EPPO with uh, the uh, Court of Justice. And last but not least, the EPPO also poses new questions and challenges with regard to what we call the extraterritoriality of European Union law in the relations with uh, third countries, meaning that the new 
the creation of this new body in the European Union actually poses also a new question in the international relations of the uh, European Union and in the relations of the European Union with uh, third um, countries. So uh, I'd stop here. I thank you very much for, uh, again, the invitation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I managed to share a bit of my uh, passion and enthusiasm for uh, this topic. Thank you very much.